when he ascended from a washed up minor leaguer on an 0 21 team to the best catcher in baseball in the span of one year, Mickey Tettleton credited his success with eating Fruit Loop cereal before every game. It became a superstition. He kept a stuffed toucan in his locker, signed balls Fruit Loops, and got sent cereal boxes in the mail to autograph. Fans cheered loops when he batted and occasionally threw Fruit Loops onto the field. The man Sports Illustrated called a serial killer was the best catcher of the early 90s and the 13th best catcher of all time in OPS, OPS Plus, and home runs. But before all of that, he was a light-hitting platoon player for the Oakland A's, called up in 1984 to catch for Don Sutton and fellow rookie Tim Burtzis, with his manager explicitly saying he, quote, didn't bring him up to hit, but rather to take charge behind the plate, end quote. A glove-first catcher who usually batted ninth, in 86 he came sixth of six in a home run contest at his college, Oklahoma State, behind four minor leaguers and a graduate assistant. That year he went on the DL with a foot infection because his doctor suspected he tied his shoelaces too tight. It was high time indeed to loosen up. His batting coach Bob Watson told him to be more relaxed at the plate, and his batting stance evolved from this to this. But he slumped badly, hitting below 200 with a 68 OPS plus the next year. A's GM Sandy Alderson couldn't find a trading partner. He was released at end of spring training 1988, a 27-year-old catcher no one wanted. Enter the most shambolic team in baseball, the 0-21 Orioles, who signed Mickey the same week they fired the face of the franchise's father. The record-losing streaks chronicled in this SB Nation article, which I've linked in the description. It's a funny, vivacious piece featuring a dog driving a car, but it's not a Mickey story, because he spent it all in AAA and debuted in this game, a shutout loss where they dropped 4-26. and 26. Sounds like a great team to hit your way into the lineup, and Mickey was finally getting a real starting job for the first time. On the A's, Tony LaRusa had insisted on platooning their catchers, holding Mickey to a hard limit of 2.11 at bats per year, which kind of reminds me of fellow A. Chris Davis hitting 247 four years in a row. Now he attempted to develop an approach, not to mention a batting stance that suited his mellow personality. He was a shy, chill dude, a silent giant who reacted to misfortune with indifference, and at the end of the day just wanted to ride his horse. Here's how he described himself. Ray asked him if that was a career year. Apologize for the audio problems on the comment from Mickey Tettleton. We'll try to get that to you a little bit later on. Mickey had a reputation for being lazy, said Orioles coach L. Rod Hendricks. Quote, people may have judged him that way because he's a slow mover. He's never in a hurry to do anything. But he's one of the hardest working people I've seen in 31 years of baseball, end quote. Which I gotta believe. Have I mentioned that Mickey was jacked? It's almost easy to miss the fact that he's built like a linebacker because his stance was, in MLB.com's words, endearingly ambivalent. Watch Tettleton straight up and down. It's like he's waiting for a bus. Well, he made, he made Tettleton commit early, but there's that erect stance that we were talking about, and you have an awful lot to do when you're a hitter to get in a hitting position when you're that erect. Thanks, Tim McCarver. Mickey described his stance as, quote, ugly, and I certainly wouldn't teach it to anyone, end quote. Hall of Famer Joe Morgan was more eloquent with his criticism. Well, he has an unusual stance. Watch where he holds his hands, how he cocks his wrist, and he's, he's got them turned already. You have to get him back into a strong hitting position. That's a very weak position to start from. He maneuvers them into good hitting position, but it takes a little time to do that. And any wasted motion, in my opinion, is not good for a hitter. I don't believe in the straight-up stance. I don't believe in unorthodox stance. It's a base hit. See, now he gets his hands in a pretty good position there, but it takes a little while to get him there, and I would think that he'd have a real trouble with a good fastball on the inside part of the plate. The trade-off is he excelled at hitting on the outside part of the plate. I'll pass the mic to batting stance guy for the next quote. There have been players who hold their bats precariously horizontal. There have been players who stood straight up. There have been players who unbuttoned their jerseys one button too many, like a guest star on Miami Vice. There have been players with an inordinate amount of chaw in their mouths. There have been players who featured an all-business steely glare at the pitcher. There have even been players who appeared to be able to bench press 400 pounds. There's only one player who put all that together and formed a company called Mickey Tattleton. That company was about one thing, cool, badass cool, end quote. Mickey's first homer for the Orioles was against his old team. He finished 1988 as a regular, albeit on a bad team, that was about to lose Eddie Murray to free agency. 
Like the 2023 Pirates, the 89 Orioles were written off before the season began. 1-0. Hit deep to left center. Fire ball! The Orioles should win. Yeah. And they do as Tettleton scores the fifth run. But Mickey Tettleton had 13 homers by May. The league lead in homers by late June was an MVP candidate in July, and the Orioles were in first place. Al Michaels called him the new babe of Baltimore, and everyone else called him Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops, I gotta get me some of those Fruit Loops. This is for Mickey. All right. Hit high and deep to right field. Way back, and it is gone. Remember, kids, eat your Fruit Loops. Hit hard, base hit down the left field line. Venable will play it out of the corner as Pendleton digs for second. He's in with a leadoff double. So the looper delivers his fourth hit of the series. A double, a single, a triple, a walk, three RBIs. Ed Nunez, the winner of last night's game, is up. And a big ovation for Mickey Pendleton to crack this game open with a three-run homer in the fourth inning. He's 20th of the season. We're talking about a relative unknown until last year sometime, and basically even entering this season. Guy that any team could have picked up. Ball one. It's still mystifying as to why the Oakland A's would release him, even though his numbers weren't very impressive with the A's. A switch hitting catcher is a rare commodity and still a relatively young player at the time of his release. Falls behind on him, 2-0. Mickey got hurt down the stretch, but still became the first Oriole catcher to win a Silver Slugger award. From last to first, said the LA Times, quote, from nowhere to stardom, he's the man given the rare second chance in life, the opportunity to play a game he loves, and finally to play it well, end quote. The Orioles fell back to earth also, still finishing a shocking second place to the Blue Jays after leading the AL East for most of the year. Mickey was named Associated Press All-Star, of which there's only one each year, playing solid defense and, quote, keeping the young Orioles staff from crumbling completely, end quote, in the words of Mike Terry of the San Bernardino Sun. In 1990, the birds migrated south of 500, and Tettleton's ultra-patient approach at the plate prompted former Orioles star John Lowenstein to suggest he switch from Fruit Loops to Special K. His hitting coach told him to just be patient and forget the strikeouts after he whiffed 36 times in his first 80 at-bats, a record for a non-pitcher. Oh, you see the names Deer and Incavelia? Remember those names. This is the footage of his 160th strikeout in 1990, a new AL record for a hitter with 100 walks, and a major league record for a hitter with 106 walks, which is what Mickey had. His new superstition was wearing the same Dick Tracy t-shirt every game, but that wasn't as fun as Fruit Loop, so the Orioles traded him in the offseason to the Tigers, but not before ending their 1990 season with this walk-off homer in his final at-bat as an Oriole. He'd miss playing in Baltimore, but Detroit is where he really flourished. From 1990 through 95, only one catcher in baseball hit 100 home runs. Mickey hit 159. Early 90s Mickey averaged 26 and a half dingers a year, and lots of them were moonshots. How many catchers do you know who hit home runs like this? Mike Piazza, JT Romuto, probably Josh Gibson. These Tigers had Cecil Fielder in his prime and healthy from 91 through 94, and Mickey had a higher OPS than him each year, winning two Silver Slugger awards to Fielder's one. He's the seventh best hitter in Tigers history with at least 2,000 plate appearances, and the second best in the past half century to Miguel Cabrera. And these are legit slugging teams who only missed the playoffs due to bad pitching. Hall of Fame manager Sparky Anderson was hungry for taters, and he got him. By the way, look at this quaint article presenting the 412 league ERA as a high number. Mickey fit right in with the homers and the strikeouts, but stood out as the quiet man on a loud, raffish team who liked to have a good time, almost untrammeled. His strikeouts were chill. He never barked at umps, and I've never seen him as much as grumble to himself on the way back to the dugout. And I've watched a lot of his strikeouts. He took them all in stride. He chewed big wads of gum at bat and blew bubbles while running the bases. His batting stance was the epitome of chill. He looked half asleep up there. Heck, even his fights were chill. Dean Dennis went out after him. Carter had presence of mind to turn to the umpire and say, listen, you can't let him do that. Because if he goes to the mound, he gets ejected. And the Jays can't afford to lose any of their players, particularly Joe Carter. Nothing more so than his walks. The guy took more pleasure standing up there like he's half asleep and walking in a run 
than actually lifting the lumber. He had more at-bats end in a full count than any other count, which is not typical, getting to full counts in 19.9 plate appearances over his career. Compare that to 10.7% for Mike Piazza, 13.9% for Joe Maurer, and just 7.7% for Salvador Perez. One quarter of Mickey's at-bats in 94 went to a full count. His extreme patience led to success against slow ballers like Mark Eichhorn, the muse of this channel, who was hit harder by Mickey than anyone else. One of these four homers is supposedly a tape measure shot that cleared the roof, but it's tough to find video of anything so specific from this era. The 91 Tigers hit 200 dingers and led the majors in homers, walks, and strikeouts, setting an AL record with 1185 Ks. They were either first or second in all of the three true outcomes the following three years. Here are the top teams in strikeout rate upon Mickey's leaving Detroit. The 94 team shattered the record. The 91 Tigers are second, and 93 Tigers are 11th. Notice the outliers in OPS plus and number of batters. Let's sort all above average hitting teams through 94 in at bats per strikeout. The Tettleton Tigers were 1, 2, 3, and 10. They're the first team ever to assemble a consistently good lineup that averaged seven strikeouts a game. And even the worst team in baseball in 2022, the Nationals, had a lower strikeout rate than the 94 Tigers. And amazingly, even as the three true outcomes have skyrocketed since 94, there's still never been a team with a higher strikeout rate, on-base percentage, and isolated power than the 94 Tigers. The next year after Mickey left, they were 10th in homers, 10th in walks, 5th in strikeouts, and the experiment was basically over. Their 91 team was ahead of its time in particular, finishing 2nd in the AL East with the league's lowest batting average, which Mickey himself called the most overrated stat in baseball. And, of course, the fewest double plays. Tony Phillips was the first player ever to make 10 starts at 5 different positions, so they were ahead of their time in other things than the 3 true outcomes. Mickey, Cecil Fielder, Rob Deere, and Travis Fryman just set the record for four teammates with 606 combined strikeouts. On April 12th, Alex Fernandez of the White Sox faced these four along with Pete Incavilia in the second inning. Who's Pete Incavilia? Oh, just the second easiest strikeout of the 20th century behind Dear No Prudence. I've highlighted the players on the Tettleton Tigers, and it's six of the top 15. Rob Deere set several records that year. Most RBI for a player under the Mendoza line, Lowest average for a player with 20 homers, lowest average by a player with 400 at-bats, and 95 more strikeouts than hits. His career stats are pretty wild. I hear Joey Gallo keeps a copy of him under his bed. And here's a long one. Oh, he's hit it a mile. Woo, up or down. But if you know anything about these teams, it's probably Prince Fielder's dad, Cecil, a man with the same physique and the same career home run total, and believe it or not, the first superstar signed out of Japan. The only reason Mickey hit fifth is Cecil was already hitting cleanup. Cecil's Tigers homered in 25 straight games in 1994, tying the major league record, with Mickey hitting the record-tying shot. Mickey made his second AP All-Star team in three years in 1991 and signed a three-year deal, becoming the highest-paid catcher in baseball. He still caught full-time in 92 and was a plus defender, but drifted over to first base and outfield after that. He led all hitters in home runs at the 93 All-Star break with two roof-clearing shots in five games. And he hit two homers into the street past right field at Camden Yards, the closest anyone had come to hitting the B&O warehouse at that time. BaseballScholar.com ranks the Fruit Loop Kid the 22nd greatest catcher in Major League history. He is the highest career OPS plus for a switch hitting catcher, is the 10th best switch hitter and 4th best hitting catcher since his debut, is the best hitting catcher of the 80s and 90s, the 5th best catcher ever in isolated power, all those stats with a minimum of 1,000 games. He's second among catchers and walks, third among all players in the early 90s in walks, and has the 16th most games with a homer, a walk, and a strikeout, with no other catcher in the top 50. A truly unique player. The only other player in history with 5,000 plate appearances, a higher strikeout rate, and a higher walk rate is Adam Dunn. And my favorite Mickey Tettleton stat, he's the third best hitting catcher from age 27 onward since World War II. The third best. And at age 27, Mickey was a free agent looking for a minor league deal. Who else on this list has that kind of career arc? Mike Piazza was Rookie of the Year at 24. Gene Tennis was World Series MVP at 25. Yogi was a four-time All-Star, and Roy Campanella was a three-time Negro League All-Star by 27. The best comparison might be Mickey's successor on the Orioles, Chris Hoyles, but he was just a late bloomer, not a wash-up from another franchise. 
It's this thread of patience that weaves through Mickey's career, at the plate gripping a lifeless bat like a bundle of weeds, on a full count fouling off pitches, in Oakland waiting for his smiling orange prince to come. Maybe that's why Bill James called Mickey the best unrecognized player of the 80s, even though it took him until his ninth pro season, 1989, to have a somewhat full year in the majors. Why didn't more people see the value of a switch-hitting catcher who could arm-wrestle a gorilla? I don't know. Why is Margaritaville marked explicit? Some answers humankind aren't meant to know. Bill James writes in his baseball abstract, Tettleton was a regular for three teams. All three teams improved substantially when they put him in the lineup and declined substantially when they replaced him. The year the Orioles made him a regular, they improved their one-loss record by 32 and a half games. The Tigers, who had lost 103 games in 1989, were around 500 all four years Tettleton was there. After they let him go in 1995, they declined from 53 and 62 to 60 and 84, then lost 109 games in 1996. When Texas signed him, they improved from 52 and 62 to 74 and 70, then won 90 games in 1996, their first 90 win season in 20 years. When Tettleton got hurt in 97, they declined by 13 games. He finished his career on the 95 through 97 Rangers, led the team in walks those first two years and homers in 95, and patient guy that he was, made his only playoff appearance in his final autumn of baseball, where his most impactful play was a walk.